this worldwide. In 2005, he was recruited back to Zurich, to the, uh, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, ETH Zurich, where he is a professor. He is chairman of the department or institute and based in the Institute of Molecular Systems Biology. Uh, he was instrumental in really launching the modern era of proteomics, genomics for all the genes, proteomics for all the proteins, and developing the tools, including specific labeling of certain residues on the proteins, and more recent methods that facilitate quantitative analysis of large numbers of proteins and interpretation of the responses of the protein complement to all kinds of systems perturbations in the form of network biology. So quantitative network biology is really his signature. Um, we have been involved together in the uh, development and progress of the Human Proteome Project. And uh, it's a great pleasure to work with him and to welcome him here to the University of Michigan. Rudy, yep. looking forward to your talk. Good afternoon. Thanks for turning out. Um, I'll do my best to make this interesting for the next 50 minutes or so. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I see a number of friends uh, and old colleagues we've interacted with. And I also see, I uh, had the pleasure to meet with students, some of which work with Alexi and with Risky, which is great to see because he was a postdoc in, in our group and actually they made enormous contributions to the field by putting the whole issue of how you identify a protein on a, on a somewhat statistically sound basis. For uh, Alexi's work, uh, there was, um, it wasn't so clear what uh, the result that was published actually meant. I'll come back to this in a, in a minute or so with a short comment. So what, what we are interested in doing or achieving eventually would be to, to determine in um, how variability, genomic, potentially also environmental variability, so influences on a cell or on a tissue or on an animal affect the phenotypes. And we, we think of the proteome uh, as an effectively a, a molecular phenotype that translates then also the biochemical reactions into the phenotypes we observe. So this is what we would like to do. And now I'm going to introduce a little bit how we approach this. And then I make uh, some comments about technical advances to make headway in this direction. And then I show some examples where we try to apply the, these approaches to answer some questions which are actually quite simple questions but complicated answers, as is usually the case. So in about, I think everyone remembers this as by way of introduction, the time uh, where the human genome draft sequence was um, announced. And this was a uh, press conference where Tony Blair here in the back and Bill Clinton in the front, they announced that scientists had generated a draft of the human genome. This was in, uh, in, in June uh, 2000. And then there came certain predictions. This is actually text from the US uh, government press release that came with this announcement. And it said that scientists will now be able to use the working draft of the human genome to alert patients that they are at risk for certain diseases, reliably predict the course of disease, precisely diagnose disease, ensure the most effective treatment is used, and develop the mean treatment. Extremely lofty and ambitious uh, predictions, of course. And the question is, how would you read out of a sequence of, of some 3 billion characters all this extremely uh, pertinent information? And uh, we, of course, know now that this is not so easy, that uh, we cannot just take a sequence and read out the, um, any of these factors. And I think what we learned is that the effectively the revolution of the genomics was not necessarily the, nest, the initial sequence draft, but then the enormous decay of cost and the ensuing throughput in doing measurements on, on genomes in, in many systems. In many cases, many instances, many perturbations. So this is also a well-known figure which I took from the NIH. And now, of course, we know that we can sequence in most 
uh, research universities, we have facility or we have access to technology which generates uh, re-measurement or measurement of large numbers of genomes reliably and not just of genomes but also of, um, of, of transcripts and, and specific cases of like chip sequencing where we can measure protein DNA interaction. So fantastic advance over the last 10 years or so. So I think the revolution really came um, apart from, of course, the milestone of having the genome, but the revolution in practical terms to translate this uh, genomics world into a, a, an effective science to answer the questions that were posed in this press release, uh, what came from the fast and accurate high reproducibility measurement of, of potentially thousands of genomes. So the massive amount of data generates patterns from which we can learn things. But even though, uh, now that we are having all this information here over at the genomic site, thousands of genomes, we have um, lots of phenotypic information that is coming out from clinical, uh, clinical studies, for instance, or from measuring uh, the lifestyle of a person, how many times, how many steps a person walks and what he eats and so on. We still have great difficulties from genomics alone to answer some really uh, exemplary questions. Uh, it seem very simple, but um, I think it would be very difficult for someone to get up and say, I can actually with some algorithm make a, a concrete statement. For instance, what is the effect of any inherited or somatic mutation on the phenotype? So if you had a particular mutation here in a particular genome, what's the phenotypic effect? In some cases, of course, through biochemical studies, we know that we know the answer. Um, this goes back to, to early genetics studies, but in general, I think this is a difficult question still. How do two or more, more independent mutations combine the phenotype? Very difficult question. How do the same inherited mutations affect different individuals with different genotypes? Also very difficult questions. Clinically, for instance, highly relevant because the same mutations in, in, the, in different individuals have different so this, um, this is, uh, I think, where we are. We have all this information here, massive amount of high quality data. With massive amount of high quality data here, the connection is difficult and even relatively straightforward questions we cannot necessarily answer without a lot of work. So this is, for instance, a, a case where this hits us uh, as researchers uh, directly. In, for instance, cancer genomic mutations, which generate increasingly large data sets of where genomic, the, the cancer genome and the adjacent um, normal genome are sequenced. And then plots like these are being generated where you have hundreds or thousands of mutations that are, are discovered in this population of initially a few hundred. Now the populations have gotten bigger, the cohorts. And then some, we see that some uh, distribution is from a paper that came out in 11, so it's one of the pioneering cancer genomic studies. You can see uh, that there is some mutation, some genes which are mutated frequently, many genes which are mutated very infrequently, but still might contribute. And I think to the to the uh, occurrence of this disease. And I think one of the difficulties is to order these mutations in a way that explain their contribution to the phenotype. So we think that. Um, this is kind of our guiding picture. We think that in between the genotypic situation and the phenotype, we would place the proteome, and we refer to the proteome in a specific instance, or not just as a proteome, as an as a, as a artificial or hypothetical ensemble of all the human proteins. But we, we therefore introduce the term a proteotype, which is the acute instance of a proteome in, the, in a particular patient or cell or, or, or tissue. So we would think that somehow or another, through mechanisms we like to learn, genotypic variants affect the proteome in terms, the proteome in terms of the uh, abundance of the proteins, but also in the way they're organized in the cell. And we would assume that the prototype here, the, the instance of this proteome, how it is present and how it is organized and composed affect the biochemical reactions which eventually determine the phenotype. So our guiding kind of guiding light or magnetic north is we would like to understand the proteotype, be able to measure it reproducibly in large number of samples and then do correlative analysis between here and here 
and between here and here. This is kind of what we attempt to uh, achieve. So now the proteome um, is, is, is very complicated. We know, of course, that the human genome contains roughly 20,000 protein coding genes. And before you can start to really do differential analysis of, of doing um, proteotype measurements, we would like to know what is actually the protein. Well, how, it is, how it is, is it composed? Which genes are being translated and in what form? And, and I've just made now a few comments to, to, this, to this part because we use the map of the proteome, a mass spectrometric map, for further developing techniques which can do rapid remeasurements as it was done in genomics where initially it took a long time to generate the first draft of the proteome. But the information in this draft was useful to then develop tools to do rapid remeasurement. So we'd like to basically follow here. So the question is, what is the proteome? And about two years ago, less than two years ago, about a year and a half ago, two papers came out in Nature, which, which, uh, which claimed uh, they both have the draft map of the human proteome, draft of the human proteome. Um, and they came out back to back in Nature, and they, they claimed that they had basically exhaustively mapped out the proteome. And, uh, in, uh, and, and these papers were then subject to relatively big discussions. And it's important, it's important to, to, to mention that here because I think it also relates actually to the work of Alexei Nezhvitsky, which, which whose work prevented or who should have prevented the appearance of these papers in their form as they were published. So what is, what is, this, what is how were these data generated? These data were generated by taking a wide variety of, of tissue samples or human human cell samples and do massive sequencing by shot, a shotgun method, a discovery method to basically establish an inventory of the proteins in a cell. This is done by breaking down the proteins into peptides and then measuring uh, peptides in a mass spectrometer. And then these proteins or these peptides are assembled in, by algorithms into proteins which are inferred from the data but never directly measured. So this is, this is the data situation that the commun community has been generating to map out the human proteome. This is courtesy of Eric Deutsch from ISB in Seattle, who maintains uh, one of these databases which collects the worldwide knowledge of proteins data that have been generated by mass spectrometry. So we can see that uh, multiple terabytes of data have been generated, hundreds of millions of spectra have been searched, and this has been growing rapidly over time. And, and so all these data were collected, searched, and then from this data, the number of proteins that were represented by these protein, by these peptides and data is, are inferred. The interesting thing is that this is the growth of peptides. This is a kind of a, a worldwide effort. This is the growth of proteins. And we can see that the protein level information that, that, the, that this is basically the, in the, the ensemble of proteins that mass spectrometers worldwide to this day have, have, have identified uh, human proteins by uh, objective criteria, by tools that were developed by Alexi, uh, is about 14,500. Each one of these papers claimed in the range of 18,000 identified proteins. So what we learned here uh, that, and this, this data here include actually the data sets were published by these two papers. And so what we concluded here, and there's been a lot of discussion, is that we, with the current methods that we are using in the, in the, in the laboratories of proteomics researchers, the number of proteins that are discoverable uh, be, will, will roughly cap out at 14,500 proteins. If you want to find the other proteins, the missing maybe four or 5,000 proteins, we need to develop some other strategy because they clearly have not come up and just taking another million or so spectra by doing the same thing and, to, and then adding it to this massive database, you're not likely to discover a large number of proteins. So we think that um, this is kind of a consensus from a lot of reanalysis of this data, that currently about 14 and a half thousand or so proteins are with the present methods discoverable with thousands of runs of a ma massive amount of investment. So this is the situation. We have essentially a, a map of the human proteome. It is not complete but it is very robust. 
and 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 efforts led by actually by Gill at Hupo, he leads an international consortium who should find evidence for the other proteins which are not yet in there. But the situation is that we kind of capped out here, and this is a large fraction of the proteome, and it's we confidently identify that. So now, um, what I'm, I think, and this is our uh, next um, kind of goal to, to, to work along these lines. We think that the real revolution in proteomics will now also come as it came in genomics after the draft was established and scientists could start working with this draft to do re-measurements on multiple samples. We think that this will also now happen in the proteomics. If we can use this draft here, the information of this reliable draft, and really start re-measuring proteomes under many different conditions potentially thousands of them, and do it reliably and fast and without, uh, without a lot of mistakes. So basically what I'm saying here at the end of this introduction is we have been focusing, if you look at this table here or this graph schematically, we, we look at the data matrix of proteomes. And so far we have been mostly been focusing on taking one or a few samples and basically generating very, very deep inventories. And I just described how far we got from this that we basically reached a saturation at a high level, but not completeness. And I think the challenge now is to take, the, to take this matrix and extend it over here into the sample number, that we can generate data matrices where proteins, ideally all of the discoverable proteins, are quantified precisely over a large number of samples. So for those who work on transcripts and in genomics, this is an old hat. This has been possible to achieve for quite a long time through methods initially of, um, of, of arrays, expression arrays, and now, of course, next generation sequencing. For us who work in protein world, this is, this is very new and has been very challenging to do. And I now describe a method which can achieve this uh, to a large extent. It cannot achieve it to all the discoverable proteins. So it, it has a limit in terms of which protein it sees or how many. But those proteins that it sees and measures, it measures highly reproducible. So we can generate such data matrices, large numbers of samples fast, with the analyte number of in a few thousand, not, not 15,000, but, but a few thousand, depending on the sample, between maybe three to 6,000 proteins. OK, now I'd like to show how we do this and, and the conceptual difference to the discovery method that was implemented here. This is based on a, on a different strategy than the discovery strategy. We basically do not say we want we have a sample and want to discover which proteins are in the sample. We have a sample and we want to ask the, we want to ask is there a, is there evidence for the presence of a specific protein in that um, in that sample? So we use this a targeting approach. We have preconceived notion what we want to measure and what we what we want to measure. We we basically do a hypothesis testing: is this protein present or not? If it's present, we see a signal. If it's not present, we do not see a signal. So there's no ambiguity there. So this is this is actually declared method of the year in, I think, 12, uh, 2013. And um, there's several implementation, implementations of that. It's basically a mass spectrometric uh, implementation of a Western blot, where you do the, the same question. You say, I have a sample. I want to ask, is a protein present, and how much of it? except we here use a mass spectrometer. And the idea is to quantify precisely specific proteins using prior information. And the original implementation was a technique called selected reaction monitoring that works very well, it's robust, and works for maybe up to 100 proteins per sample. And then we developed a different technique, which is um, doing the same thing, but massively parallel for thousands of proteins. So this technique I'm now going to explain. This is how the proteome looks to a mass spectrometer. So we, 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 we basically see, um, we take the proteins that are extracted from a sample, and we digest them into peptides. And no one actually knows well, how many peptides are being generated. There's estimates from like 10 million to potentially 100 million different peptides that are being generated from a proteome, but we don't know really for sure. Why is it so many? Because Proteins are highly modified. They're they're very they're variable. They're splices. We don't actually know how a proteome looks like in its composition. 
but, but, but it's 10 or 100 million, it's a very large number compared to what the mass spectrometer can sample. So typically, this is, so the axis here, a retention time, this is chromatographic dimension where peptides are separated and then injected into the mass spectrometer. And this is the mass of these peptides that are being detected by the mass spectrometer. So within this window uh, that we can specify, most of the peptides that are generated from a proteome will be present. And the task is now to, in one way or another, take all these peptides, one after the other or in some other way, and determine their sequence. And this is done by selecting the peptide and fragmenting it into fragments. The peptide alone is not, mass alone does not have enough information to infer the sequence of the peptide. So the, how, the way this has been classically been done, is the mass spectrometer picked one after the other of these precursors, these peptide ions, fragmented it, and recorded the fragment ion spectrum. And that led to the discovery of these about 15,000 proteins that are constituting the human proteome mass. But it cannot, it is not fast enough in contrast to next generation sequencing, which is massively parallel. The mass spectrometer is not fast enough to go after all these peptides in the real time. So it always missed some examples basically out of a very large pool. So the advantage that was re realized with this uh, technique, this SWAS technique, is to basically break down this whole range where the peptides elute into, uh, in, this is kind of corrupted, but it doesn't really matter, uh, to break it down into tens of thousands of little pixels, which, diff which are, have the dimensions of uh, retention time about 100 milliseconds and, and 20 or so mass units. In each one of these pixels, there may be multiple of these peptide precursors present, and then we don't care. So we don't try to, to do one after the other. We select everyone who is in a pixel and concurrently fragment them. So within the duration of about an hour or so, about ten, tens of thousands of these pixels are isolated, or the peptides in these pixels, they're concurrently fragmented, and then record it in a computer to generate basically a complete fragment ion map of the, all the peptides that are present in this sample, but, the, but, but ordered in the way in which pixel they, arri they, were, uh, they arrived. And so this is what we obtain. We obtain a complete MSMS fragment ion map for all the analytes in a single sample injection. And this takes now about two hours to, to uh, accomplish. The, the, the price we pay is that the spectra that are being generated, fragment ion spectra, as shown here, are complicated and they are composed of the fragment ions of multiple precursors. Because the, everything that's in this pixel is isolated and fragmented and recorded concurrently. So all the search engines that we were using and used to, they always assume that the fragment ion spectrum is derived from one isolated precursor and so they don't work here anymore. So I, I show this here by colors. Well, these, this, this, the green ones might be fragments from one, from one peptide, the red ones from another peptide, and they were concurrently fragmented. So we, we, we cannot easily deconvolute that, but we found a trick um, that, to do this. And we use prior information to find basically in this spectra those fragments that, uh, that are, provide evidence for the presence of a particular peptide. And we do this by using the retention time here dimension, and we basically extract from this very complicated fragment ion map the, the signals for the fragments that are corresponding to one peptide. We need to know how, what these are. So we basically first need to generate a, a library of spectral assays, of, or a library of spe fragment ion spectra for each peptide that we want to measure. And this information we use then to go into this complicated map and say this one, this one, and this one precisely co correspond the fragment ions that are correlated with one peptide. They elude precisely together, which is, of course, a precondition that they are from the same peptide. And there's a number of other uh, features that are uh, being comp computed in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a composite um, function to then tell us that, indeed, in this complicated spectrum, there's evidence for the presence of the green peptide, maybe the other peptide as well. So this. This is what we, we're doing. Basically, to say it again, we use a reference library. It's a precondition. We use uh, a number of peptides we want to search. 
we then go into this data set, we generate these peak groups which uniquely identify a peptide, and we then say if this peak group has certain properties and a certain uh, probability value compared to noise, we say we have quantified and identified this peptide in the sample. So this is the approach you've been taking, and I said we need this reference library, and Alexi recently developed a tool which builds these libraries kind of on the fly. Uh, it's it's an ingenious way to support this type of data analysis. We, in, in our way of doing it, we had to first generate the library a priori. We can then use this, and Alexi basically has a tool now that generates these libraries right, uh, right on the fly from the data that are being acquired here in this swath mode, which presents in advance in the field. So we, we generated some libraries. Uh, so we have complete library for Cervicia, for coli, for mycobacterium tuberculosis. So complete means that this, every protein has minimally one, ideally several peptides for which there is represent, uh, corresponding fragment ion spectra available, and also for more than 10,000 human proteins. So I think the, the assay library generation issue is solved, either by the availability of such, of such um, uh, libraries online to people can use, or through Alexis, uh, uh, Alexis tool, the DIA umpire tool. Okay, so to complete this, conclude this technical part, we can go relatively quickly with, within, within a day, actually a working day, we can go from biopsy needle, needle biopsy level tissues, or from uh, in the range of 50 to 100,000 cells through a system that reproducibly and um, quite quickly generates peptides out of these tissues and cells uh, into the mass spectrometer to generate one, a file from each sample. And we can do this with um, within a working day, with about eight hours from sample to file. And we can do this now for um, about 20 samples a day. In, a, in an instrument. And so this is very, where we are technically. Well, of course, it depends uh, the instrument that's used. So this, the instruments that are used, these here are relatively cheap. Yes, and this one is fairly expensive. Uh, this initially was developed on, for aficionados on SIEX instruments, and now it also runs on thermo instruments, which are more robust, and they cost in the range of, uh, in US, probably I would say six, seven hundred thousand US dollars. And then each run actually is very cheap because we, we don't need um, enzymes except a bit of trypsin, but we don't need um, like Illumina type stuff. We don't need any kits. Uh, so I would say uh, it's, it's less than hundred dollars, but that's just that's just a guess. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then what, so the I said this before. We can measure now from such a file about forty thousand peptides and corresponding to maybe five thousand proteins, and that is going to keep up now that different manufacturers try to compete to make the instruments better. Okay, so this is the situation now what I'm, where, we, where we're at technically. We, I showed this before, and now we would like to ex exploit this prototype and ask specific questions, uh, which I'm now getting to. So we, we basically say, we would, if we do serial measurements on, let's say, genetically perturbed or otherwise perturbed, environmentally perturbed prototypes, if we do this long enough, with enough proteins and with sufficient precision, we can use computational tools to learn some new biology. That's the, that's the um, question for the state starting position. So now I would like to get to three vignettes. I won't get to this one for time, but I would, should have deleted that, sorry. So I'd like to ask, does the genotype control the quantitative prototype? This seems like a simple question, but it is actually an important one if you want to say, well, if we have mutation in here, what is the effect on the, onto this protein landscape? You should know what are the rules. Is, for instance, is, is, is how, how, are, how are the quantitative changes that we observe here related to, to genotypic change? That's one question. The second one we would ask, how does the genomic perturbation affect the prototype? So now let's say if you have a, a wild type 
uh, wild type genotype, and we now add, for instance, the chromosome. What is the effect on the proteome uh, if this added chromosome is, is dropped in? Or if we delete a region of a chromosome, what is the effect? Is it simply that the proteins encoded on that chromosome are now no longer present or double as, as much, or what is the effect? And the third question is how does the species maintain a constant phenotype in view of genotypic variability? So if we have genotypic variable, we are all very variable, I mean, from a genotypic side, but we are all relatively similar phenotypically, so how is this maintained? So these are three vignettes I'd like to um, address now. So the first one is a uh, research question. Does the genotype control the quantitative prototype? And so the experiment we, we did here, the study where we used these techniques I just described, was to do protein protein quantitative trait analysis in a genetic reference strain compendium. So I will go explain these terms in a second. But the experimental approach was to use targeted mass spectrometry of protein components of metabolic system in yeast and to relate the abundance of these proteins back to genetic variants in a reference population. So protein, protein quantitative trait, loci uh, studies, aim at correlating the protein abundance with genetic variation. We can do this if we can measure the quantity of specific proteins precisely, and if we know the, the, in, a, in a panel of, of conditions, for instance, strains, what their gene, gene, genomic makeup is, so we can then link the allele, uh, a particular allele, to the abundance of a protein, and, and that then establishes this relationship. And we did this with um, a resource that was generated by Rachel Brehm and Leonid Krugliak. And these are yeast strains which are derived from, from mating two strains, a laboratory strain and a wild type strain. And out of this mating, they generated 100 uh, progeny strain segregants. And each one of these segregants is, of course, a clone. I mean, it's a strain that is at the, where the cells in there are genetically identical. And we know that from each one of these strains, the genome is composed of the of segments of the two parental strains here, but uh, but are proportioned in different relationships through through um, through through the combination. So these hundred strains are like brothers and sisters. We have multiple cells, of course, they can be grown indefinitely, and we can we, the genotype is known, and it has limited variability because they all derive from these two parents. So this is work, now I'm showing, this is work from Paula Picotti when she was a postdoc in our group uh, and did this study. So we basically took, she selected the most variable proteins for measuring, doing some uh, initial measurements. We, she did then um, enrichment, or goal enrichment for metabolic proteins. We wanted to have some metabolic maps. And she basically used this pathway to, and the variable proteins to generate a a pathways of proteins that are uh, metabolic, that constitute part of the metabolic system. And each one of these proteins, she measured and quantified across each one of these strains. So she ended up with 50 proteins. This is a relatively small scale study. We've now done, we've now done it in, uh, in, in with 3,000 proteins with the SWOS technique, but I don't have the data fully analyzed yet. So I talk about the principle here with relatively small scale. But the principle is exactly the same. We have basically 50 proteins that constitute a coherent system, a uh, metabolic system, uh, quantified across 96 strains. And this is what we get uh, as the raw data. So this is now this matrix I talked about at the beginning. These are, these are the strains. These are the 50 proteins. And you can see, which is novelty for proteomics, that virtually all the pixels here are complete. So there's relatively few missing values. These data are very good for quantitative, quantitative analysis because we have, we have almost a complete data set. So about 30 proteins validated uh, were validated to be under control of at least one gene. So these are QTLs, and a number of genomic reasons were involved. So, so now what came out? This is um, now the result of the analysis of this data matrix by trying to now correlate the abundance of these proteins back to the genomic loci. And we see, uh, we basically start, a, a network starts to appear, which is very interesting to observe. So we, the network is composed of the following. 
the, white, the yellow dots here are proteins which are quantified in this study across the strains. The um, blue triangles are the genetic loci which control the abundance of these proteins. So this comes out from the association study. And then the edges here mean that this triangle controls the abundance of these proteins. If, pro if there is th thick connections here, this means these proteins physically interact to form a complex that carries out a, a, a particular function. So this is a basically a functional model. So okay, what, what do we see? We see a reasonably, even though this is relatively few elements, we see already a fairly complicated network emerging. We see, for instance, that some proteins are, are under the control of several loci. We see loci that control multiple uh, proteins in their abundance. And we see that the members of a complex here, which presumably catalytic, form, uh, perform collectively a catalytic function, that each one has its own regulatory system in the, in the genome. This, this was a surprise to, certainly to me, because I thought if proteins are associated to form a complex, they might also be under common control. Like, for instance, we learn in the operon system in, 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 in prokaryotes, and this distinctively does not seem to be the case. So this is basically what, come out, what came out. And I wanted to ask here first, does the genotype control the quantitative prototype? It certainly does. So we can establish this through target mass spectrometry. Um, we, we learn that the parental strains acquire independent genetic variations. These are the, the various alleles that affect the levels of proteins from the same modular pathway. So it's, it's, it's distinctively different from an operon type model in bacteria. We see that selective pressure fa uh, favors the acquisition of polymorphisms that maintain the stoichiometry of complex pathways. This is a theme which I'll come back over and over again that I think we now learn that it is not only the abundance of proteins, but also their modularity, how they interact in, in three dimensions with each other. It turns out to be a, a, a theme that's coming forward. And we learn that genetic variability affects metabolic mechanisms. We've now made analogous studies in mice uh, basically, an analogous breeding, um, breeding um, cohort has been generated by an international consortium called the BXD Mouse Genetic Consortium. Uh, and we did me similar measurements I just described in these, and we have exactly the same uh, results. So conceptually, mice and, and, um, and, and, and yeast seem to do things in, in a similar way, control the prototype in a similar way, and op op apparently different from prokaryotes. Second question now I want to address is how does a genomic perturbation affect the prototype? So the, 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 um, we now see that there is clearly a linkage between genomics and the quantitation, quantitative expression of the proteins. I would like to see if we perturb that. What happens if we drop in basically a hand grenade, what happens to the prototype? And the experiment here, we, we, it goes back of a, on a unique opportunity we have to work with, which is, um, which is, um, which is cells from twins, um, where the one twin is a wild type, basically a normal uh, karyotype, and the other has an extra chromosome 21. So he's, he's, he has uh, his Down syndrome. This is an extremely rare event, and through Filiano uh, Santanorakis in Geneva, we got access to, to these cells from, this, from these two individuals. And so it's basically everything is genetically identical, except one has an extra chromosome. So the experimental approach is to do proteomic measurements on the composition turnover of fibroblasts from this twin pair, uh, where one is trisomic and the other one is not. So um, this is basically a, a graphical abstract. The DNA for chromosome 21 is 1 and a half to 1. Is the question is the RNA 1 and a half to 1? Is it just constricted to chromosome 21, transcripts and proteins, or same for proteins? And so we basically have fibroblasts from these two individuals, and we do the protein measurements. About 4,000 proteins were um, quantified in this context, in this experiment. So here are now some results. We now have the normal state, the zomic state, protein versus uh, RNA, and we see a, a, some form of correlation, which is what we typically get 0.4, 0.5 protein in steady state. So it's not 
this is not really distinguishable, but when we look at the fault change uh, induced by a fault change of protein, the basic the ratio of mRNA to mRNA from the two individuals, a protein to the two individuals, the, the correlation essentially falls apart. So they both maintain a landscape of transcripts to proteins which has a certain degree of correlation, which is quite common in, in and has been observed many times. When we look at how, how, do, they, how do they react at the pro protein and transcript level to the addition of an, of an additional chromosome, 21 in this case, there's virtually no correlation. So this is an interesting observation. And then we, we also asked what is, since this, this means that something must happen at the transcription or post-transcription level, we wanted to see, can we distinguish whether this uh, lack of correlation can be explained to, for instance, added protein turnover, increased protein turnover, increased protein synthesis, or combination thereof. So Yan Sheng Lu, who is the postdoc who works on this, did a, a pulsed Silac experiment, which basically means he makes all proteins light, and then at a particular time, he does a pulse chase with a heavy amino acid, and then this is incorporated over various times. And then at various time points of this pulse experiment, we, uh, he harvests cells. And then we can measure the, the abundance of the old protein, the light, the emergence of the heavy protein that's the newly synthesized in this period, and the ratio of the two, uh, the total sum, which tells us whether there is more degradation than more synthesis. So basically, that's what we, what we can look at. At every time point, we can see the for every protein that we quantify, the, the old protein, the emergence of the new protein, and potential decrease of the old protein, which gives the deg an indication of degradation. So there's formalism that uh, describes this. We can basically measure the protein turnover on a large number of proteins. OK, now we, we, um, we post here the data on the transcript level, the protein level, and the turnover level. Um, so these are three layers of information uh, and segregated into, into chromosomes. So we see here, at the first sight, we immediately see that dropping in these additional uh, chromosomes does not just affect the proteins and transcripts from this chromosome, but has a, has a broad effect on the overall proteome or transcriptome uh, that is being measured. We also see that here, uh, chromosome 21, which is a small chromosome, has a very distinctive upregulation in general of the genes encoded it by it at the mRNA level. There's no, none down because of the other chromosomes. We always have also some down regulated here, not here, so they're upregulated. And this is not true for the pro for the protein. Protein has already a buffered kind of uh, 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 response to the emerge to the add addition of this extra chromosome. And when we look at the protein trends and the trend at the turnover rate we see basically no difference between 21 and this other chromosome. OK, so this is just a graphical representation over here of the, of the data. Um, basically, these are the proteins encoded by chromosome 21. You see here the transcript fold change, protein fold change, and the degradation rate fold change. And we see a clear, clear difference. So there's different regulation at the various levels. OK, now we asked, so um, from the tip, this is just Go annotation, we see that certain, certain groups of proteins are up in trisomy and down in trisomy and up. So I'll, I'll come back to some of these in a minute. But now the interesting thing we see is that the, when, so we're asking the question, why are certain proteins behaving differently from others? Is it, is, if it's not transcription, it must be something post transcription. So the, the hypothesis was generated. That, pro, that, the, that the level of protein, at the level of protein complexes, buffering is occurring. Because you can imagine that if you have a complex consisting of three or four proteins from other chromosomes, and then all of a sudden you have an extra of those of a protein from chromosome 21, we would, this protein has nowhere to go. It will be likely to degrade. And so the, buff, the complex actually acts as a buffer for emerging excess proteins, in that it has no place to go, it will be degraded. So we tested this with the data that I just showed. So here, this is, uh, the graph is, we have um, the, the log fold change, this is me versus normal, or for RNA, protein, and degradation. 
And we have the proteins that are within a complex, which is derived from, we don't, didn't do this measurement, it's derived from quorum or databases which, um, which describe protein complexes and proteins which are not been found to be in a complex, which does not necessarily mean that they're not in a complex, simply has not been found. So the amplitude that we see might be actually bigger in reality, but that's the information we have. So we see here that um, for the um, chromosome 21 proteins, at the transcript level, we see a slight different, not statistically very significant, we see a slight different that there is the, uh, the, the transcript in proteins within complex is slightly higher than outside. But it's not really significant. No, for other proteins from other chromosomes, at the transcript level, we see nothing. And we see a distinctive, statistically significant difference for the chromosome 21 proteins. So the ones which are within the complex are, um, are not really changing. And the ones which are outside of a complex, they're changing uh, more, more strongly, significantly different. So this, is, this supports the hypothesis. That the, that, the, that the complex acts as a buffer. And we, for proteins which are not from, which are from other chromosomes, we don't see this statistical difference. And then we see the, the opposite here, this degradation. Proteins within a complex are, um, are, are, are relatively uh, stabilized, and the proteins which are uh, outside of the complex are, are degraded in this, in this twin samples. So, this supports the notion that at the level of the protein complex, these proteins are stabilized in their abundance, and this is a post-transcriptional event. And, and uh, so this, this is one way how the cell buffers uh, genomic variants by, for instance, introduction of additional genes. Now, we, now we wanted to learn a bit more. We, 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 we broke this the regulated protein down in quintiles. So these are the strongly up. Uh, not so strongly up and, so, and strongly down regulated proteins. We asked, how do these proteins behave? What are they doing? And do, are there, is there concurrent activities or regulation occurring? And what we find is an interesting finding, I probably, is that, um, the, that they find organelle-specific degradation in, in Down syndrome. So we find that proteins uh, don't only act coordinately in, com in complexes, but also distinctively in terms of, um, of organelles. So maybe you can show this here. These are the proteins. Uh, uh, proteins are specifically modeling um, the specific organelles. These are the organelles that we talk about. And this is the mRNA protein degradation synthesis rates that are calculated out of this data. And we see that different organelles, proteins in different organelles, have different patterns. So, for instance, this pattern here, the lysosome, would say the mRNA between the trisomy case and the wild type is not really changed. The protein uh, is the protein level is down, um, degradation level is up. So that means a certain amount of protein was present is now more strongly degraded. So this we could call as degraded degradation regulation. Another one is 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 here. The the transcripts are up in trisomy. The protein is down in trisomy. This, uh, this is this is number of proteins from this organelle. It's not just one protein. And then and then this is achieved by uh, by increasing the degradation rate and decreasing the synthesis rate. So this a complex coordinated expression control of, of proteins which are which is unique or at least a certain patterns which are, which occur and are, are specific for specific organelles. So we have. Degradation regulated, degradation buffering, uh, not regulated, um, translational regulated, and so on. So these, we can give these patterns a name, and these patterns apply preferably to specific um, organelles or specific um, regulatory uh, um, uh, complexes, like, for instance, the ribosome. So we, we want to ask here, um, does, does the addition of a chromosome, basically a massive perturbation of the genotype, lead to changes in the in the proteome, prototype, and how is this trans transmitted into the prototype? Is it simply a linear translation or, from the changes that occur transcriptionally, or are there other effects at work? And we can distinctively see a lot of other effects. We can distinctively see that the protein abundance and the transcript abundance do not uh, correlate well. 
that there is protein abundance measurement or buffer changes buffer at the level of the complexes and at the level of organelles because organelles apparently acquired through mechanisms which you don't know different patterns of how they is react the proteins in these organelles how they react to the addition of these extra chromosomes so down syndrome uh, so i'm noted here at this point down i think one important thing we learned again that's exactly what we saw already in the first example is that dosage compensation through proteomic buffering affects or is at least in part mediated to protein complexes namely the higher order structure of the of the proteins exactly what we already saw in the yeast example of course i'm a little late so i go very fast hopefully not um, um, too fast to make still understand it. we'd like to answer the third question and that is how does a species maintain a constant phenotype in view of genotype, genotypic variability. So the, the, this is, of course, also an important question in view of that a, in throughout the, the um, life, every person, probably in every cell, acquires a number of mutations, which are usually not detrimental. Some, of course, are, but we see from cancer genomic studies that there's a huge amount of variation is acquired and maybe it does not really do a whole lot, so it's, it's somehow buffered. And we wanted to ask, how is the cell achieving that? So this uh, is the study design. It is, this is work in Drosophila, where we work with strains which have been um, caught and then made into lines by McKay and, and co-workers and were published in Accessible. We then measure a phenotype. This is the wing size. Of, it's a highly, highly selective phenomenon of phenotype in, wing, in flies because the wing cannot fly properly. It will, of course, die out. So these wing sizes in these strains, even though they're highly variable, remarkably variable, one in 40 base is, is a SNP, so there's enormous genomic variability, they manage to, through selection, to maintain a phenotype in the from point of view of wing size and shape and aerodynamics that the cell actually, that the fly can fly. It's a, it's a remarkable achievement. And so we wanted to measure the prototype of these wing discs, because the precursors of the wing, and correlate this prototype with this highly selected phenotype. So as, as a phenotype which is highly selected and, and not very variable. So this is the, the outline, these are disks, and they lead to wings, and these wings can have various sizes, shapes, and we measured, so um, this is Sibyl Bonesh, she a, was a graduate student, she did morphometric analysis of these wings. She selected some <coughs> strains from these flies which have small wings, and some flies that have big wings. These are not individual flies, of course. These are strains, so they're identical. We need multiple animals. We grow these larvae, uh, dissected out these wings, these wing discs, and then we did protein measurement on these wings, wing proteins, and we could identify uh, close to 10,000 peptides corresponding to about 2,000 uh, proteins. Across the, across the different strains, and these are the proteins. So we see again a matrix which have virtually no missing now. So we see already that the big wing, uh, small wing, uh, in, are interspersed. So they, they're, they're sufficiently close together <coughs> that they do not cluster in big wing flies and small wing flies. This, this is remarkable but given the enormous genomic variability and the importance of this phenotype. They're really not, they don't cluster in. In, in, in an obvious way when we just look at the proteins. However, there's information in the proteins for sure. This is a, a correlation analysis. Now, basically, uh, we look for whether there's signal in noise, and we see that we, when, we correlate, um, when we correlate proteins, abundances from replicate value, replicate measurements, uh, this is the blue distribution. We have a very, very tight uh, correlation. That means the data is of very high quality quantitatively. And these are data called protein measurement from non-replicates, let's say, between big wing and small wing flies. So they're clearly this distribution of correlation factors is different from the replicates. So that means there's biological signal in the data set, even though it is not sufficient to lead to very distinctive big wing to small wing clusters. So the samples are highly related, but there's, there's, there's biological signal detected in the data set. And now we worked with this biological signal to see how mechanistically or biochemically can we learn something about how this uh, big wing size, or small size, is, is maintained and what the, the buffering mechanisms might be and what the mechanisms are that actually generate 
um, are, are responsible for the big wing and the small wing phenotype. So this is um, basically a, um, a correlation analysis to find those proteins uh, that segregate uh, with, so this each dot here is a protein, each protein has a, has a color number, and we see proteins that are uh, correlated with um, large wing size up here, proteins with small wing, wing size down there. So this is basically just finding those proteins which show in their abundance pattern a correlation with the wing size. And then we group these proteins together and we see um, this is basically done by looking for pairwise correlations of abundance uh, across all these proteins that were measured and have significant differences. And we see then that pro and we, we project then these correlations on a string network, which is a network of protein interactions. So we see a number, so the blue is the basic string network. These are modules of proteins which have very strong correlation with either big, big, big wing or small wing um, phenotype. And so we see some clusters emerge, whereas others are not really uh, affected. So the clusters that emerge are mitotic cell cycle, glycolysis, chromosomal protein, um, and, and mitochondrial respiration. There's also the proteasome and the ribosome eventually came out. But these are basically groups of proteins which are involved in a specific biological biochemical function, which are coordinately affected or correlated in their expression with a small or a large wing size. So what we basically like to say here is we have the world of SNPs, which is extremely rich in these flies, and about 1 in 40 nucleotides is a SNP. These SNPs are then translated into, uh, of course, in the genes into, into RNA, in proteins, in the phenotype. We've measured this phenotype and we found the proteins which correlate with this, with this phenotype. We also did the other way. I don't have time to talk about it. We have also a lot of uh, protein QTLs, which relate specific SNP sequence variants to uh, bonds of the protein. I don't talk about that. Talk about this correlation here. And what we find is that the up uh, at the end is that what determines a large or a small wing size is not necessarily the the um, regulatory proteins, which which are we all know like the the, the core or hippo signaling or insulin signaling, they're certainly important to drive the big engines, but what really matters is metabolism. And we see a shift um, from the big, from the, from the wing size, glucose metabolism is up, and mitorespiration is down. So this is basically what we also see in cancer as the Warburg effect. And so this, this is one of the big determinants that, that shifts the cell from uh, the, the, the wings, from a small wing size to large wing size. We also see one uh, significant change in chromatin. Uh, this is a factor which affects histones, leads to a transcription factor leads to expression of histones. If this is down, it, then the histones are down, and that generates more loose chromatin, and that also uh, correlates with the, wing, with the wing size. And the third part is a regulatory system, core signal. So we basically conclude is there is enormous variability at the level of the genome. This is, this, is trans, this is transcribed and transmitted, translated into a protein uh, landscape, into a prototype. This prototype is maintained extremely stably, probably through mechanisms that we encountered before in this, chrom in this chromosome 21 situation, that, there is, that the variability from here to here is buffered. And then the, there is, but it is not completely buffered, because otherwise the um, phenotypes would be identical, which they are not. We see that the big that the big determinants that associate with the wing size are or determine the wing size are shift in metabolism. It's a very very slight shift. It's like 10% shift and to and chromatin um, organization. So very very old, very very broad processes, and that we think now the regulatory processes like insulin signaling and so on affects eventually these these small shifts, these small, small shifts it actually catalyze the, the change. So this is the summary of this uh, part, which I just said. And then I'd like to finish here with a take home message. Um, we all know that next, next generation sequencing is discovering enormous genomic variability. It's a fantastic resource to work with. 
the relationship between genotypic and phenotypic variability is largely unknown. We cannot really have a program yet that says, okay, if this mutation occurs in this backdrop, this is what's happening. Uh, the, we pursue the idea that the modular, modular prototype is kind of the translator Rosetta Stone linking genotype to phenotype because this is where the biochemical reactions happen. In the last example I just showed that, that very large biochemical functions like metabolism have a strong um, the phenotypic determinant. And the cell compute changes of perturbation in the genome in complex nonlinear ways, which we now start to uncover by these multi layered measurements. And what we also find in each one of these examples is that the context matters. So we talk about complexes and modules. It is clearly so at the proteome level that the protein itself is important, but equally important is it's in relation to how it is embedded in the proteome as a whole. And I think there will be, it's a gross area, a very important gross area for proteomics to really understand how these complexes form, how they're changing in after some um, mutation and what the, what the functions are, functional concepts are on these cells. And what I try to show is that there's now technologies that allow us to pre quite precisely measure the prototype, not completely, but fairly extensively with at least a few thousand proteins. So finally, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues and then be happy to answer some questions. The SWAS development was the work of Ludwig Ludovic Schie, Pedro Navarro, and uh, Steve Tate from AB Sciex, now worked on by Ben Collins and Yan Sheng Lu. And then this uh, um, software was developed by Hannes Röst and George Rosenberger to support this analysis. And now I also mentioned that Alexi has written software that uh, works on this type of data. The Wing Fly Science project was a project of Hiro Okada with Alex Sebhardt from our group, together with Sibyl Fonesh and Ernst Hafen for fly geneticists. And the PQTL project was done mostly by Paula Picotti with help and data analysis from Clement, Mathieu Clement, Pisa, and Andreas Bayer from um, University of Cologne, and Trisamit 21 project is mostly from Yan Sheng Lu and collaboration with Juliana Santomarakis in uh, Geneva. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer my questions. something like a, a three yard long monolithic column to separate uh, uh, peptides from E. coli and claimed he could see every protein from the E. coli genome. Has somebody actually tried to use some type of new technology, separation technology to try to up that number? I mean, is there a limitation because of the overlap that you see between peptides? So. Um, um, without seeing the data, I would be fairly skeptical that we saw all proteins simply because no one has ever seen all proteins that are encoded in a, in a genome in any case yet, and, and the, <clears throat> in any situation yet. And the, the data that I showed, this is the accumulation of, of virtually tens of thousands of, of, of LCMS semester. And people have used various columns of various lengths, thickness, and so on. So it just seems uh, that Roughly, with the techniques we all use in terms of how we extract proteins, we use the, how we digest them, uh, how we mass spec them, that's roughly where we get. That's not to say that the others do not exist, but I think one would need to do something more innovative than just taking uh, a longer column and think that then all of a sudden the number goes up. And I think this is what Gil's, the project Gil is leading and Hupo is trying to do. It tries to say, okay, what are the proteins that are missing? It should be expressed and then try to find them by, for instance, by targeting. And, but I think whenever, when someone claims that they make a gigantic jump and from like 14 to 18,000 in this business is quite a gigantic jump, uh, then it, it, the most likely explanation is, unless they do something really different, the most likely explanation would be that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's software related. Mm -hmm. um, well, um... Yeah. <clears throat> 
people are finding, sorry, uh, these very low abundance long non-coding RNAs are actually encoding proteins. And I wondered if you had a thought about that. The second question is uh, very self-serving. Uh, John Hardy and I, many years ago, um, uh, not only were involved in cloning of the amyloid precursor protein on chromosome 21, but you know people that have trisomy uh, get uh, Alzheimer's disease. And we speculated that it was a lysosomal phenomenon. And so I was interested to see, you started out there. I know they were all different, but you had the different organelles across there. And I wondered if there wasn't some kind of basic defect in the lysosome in those identical twins. So it's really two very different questions, right? I mean, have you thought about looking at the products of long non-coding RNAs, so which the, are proteins? The, we haven't. Some of them. <clears throat> and I'm sure someone has. And for instance, if it, it would be, it would be, of course, a reasonable uh, effort to, to do that. I mean, maybe that's something that Gil could comment on whether someone in this Hupo uh, proteome project is doing. But it, it's a reasonable, it's a reasonable thing to do. And technically, it's certainly feasible. You would just have to say we allow certain coding. Uh, coding frames to be part of the, of the search space. Then you would either find them or not. And then, of course, you have to be careful with how you filter this, how you filter this data. But it, from, a, from a technical point of view, it's nothing. Um, big no, so the abundance issue is not really a big issue anymore, I think. We can yeah. say that. So, so with, with some sensible fractionation, one can get down to very low levels of protein. The issue which where we still have trouble is uh, solubility like membrane proteins. I think they are they are largely underrepresented in this, in this map. And some proteins which only occur in very specific uh, tissues, like and there's a big discussion about the nasal epithelium, like olfactory receptors, and, and so on. Which of course will be hard to find because we normally they don't. Exist. So I forget it. <coughs> oh yeah. So we don't have any functional. Evidence, we just followed what, what the proteins are doing, and then we, we came from the total protein measurements to these organelles. And clearly, a lot is going on in, in lysosomes. But how this functionally translates into lysosomal function, I don't know. But one could, of course, measure that. Uh, from this. So Rudy asked for a comment on uh, long non-coding RNAs and other RNAs, small ORPs, and so forth. There are a lot of claims for production. And it is quite possible that some of these RNAs do get translated into protein sequences. However, those that have been reported, especially the two articles that he cited early in the lecture, have been examined carefully by many other labs now uh, in the data sets provided by those two groups. And nearly every single one was a false positive, including even a perfect match to porcine trypsin. Hello. Uh, that's easily explained. And uh, Alexi. And I actually ran a workshop with our uh, T32 proteomics informatics graduate students here. And many of them are pretty expert identifying uh, these kinds of flaws in data sets. It's, uh, it's a matching challenge. Now, even if you have good spectra, you may be incorrect in the protein sequence. It could be that the, if for, you, for example, if you have an isoleucine instead of a leucine, that is indistinguishable for sure. If you have a methylated arginine, you may have an isobaric post-translation modification indistinguishable. If you have a single amino acid substitution, you may now have a peptide from a very common protein reported thousands or tens of thousands of times, like serotransferrin, called to be novel, or to match to a link RNA, or to a pseudogene. And it's all false positives as far as we can ascertain. Let's say we have far more probable explanations for the peptide sequence identified. You can have an excellent peptide sequence, and if the match to the uh, reference proteome is flawed, the reference is incomplete, which it surely is for many variants, or sometimes the reference proteome itself is based upon a rare variant for that gene product, and you're measuring a common version. So all these examples were found in many, many cases. Okay. Just checking, David. Any students got questions? I hope. Oh, good.
Uh, great talk. So, uh, so actually, I have a question about uh, the technique of the, for the quantitative tactic um, proteomics. So let's say we have some samples. We know the genome type of the samples. We know some sample carry lung synonymy mutations. So we want to quantify um, some protein expression and use a mass spectrometer. So what would be the best approach to quantify both Y type and, and mutant um, proteins simultaneously? Simultaneously, so there, there, one allele is mutated and the other is not. Or? Yeah, like you know, maybe a substitution. Um. Well, so if you really want to get a statement of that, you would need to, you would need to hit on the peptide that carries the mutation. Right? Otherwise, you have no, no information. So I would recommend that we would do. Uh, I mean, if, if it's relatively few proteins, I would set up a targeting assay by SOM, which is most precise measurement for. A number of peptides some are shared between the two forms and the ones are different and you could then you could uh, actually figure it out quite precisely you would you you would have to take into consideration that the peptide intensity signal uh, from the mutated form and the wild type form it, you cannot just take the signal and then say it's it's that much you would have to have an, an appropriate um, an appropriate uh, reference peptide in, in but that's a, it's a, you could do with the SOM with a, with a heavy label peptides. So it would be quite a straightforward measurement. And if you wanted to do this for large numbers of proteins, larger numbers, and I would, for instance, suggest this uh, SWOS method or derivatives thereof, which, which do the same measurement on large numbers. But in every case, you would want to you would want to add uh, to be really quantitatively accurate uh, an isotope rate of peptide. If we just here we just look for for um. Differences, both change between samples, and then we don't add these references because we're not interested in the absolute amounts, on, but in, in, in changes. And that's actually quite robust. I hope everybody realized uh, this is a dramatic development in proteomics. The targeted proteomics approaches. Uh, Rudy has been worldwide leader in this development of the proteome wide uh, selected reaction monitoring methods and tools and databases, spectral libraries, <laughs> synthetic peptides now available through uh, uh, purchase. And now the SWATH MS, which is data independent method, as contrasted with a data dependent method. Maybe you'd say a few words about these critical new methods. More than your group here. Yeah. So um, we were, and as for a long time, and most most um, projects in this, in this Field are this what's called shotgun or, or data dependent methods. You basically acquire a signal for the for the intact peptide masses. There's usually many such signals present concurrently, and then the mass spectrometer makes a decision which one to select for fragmentation. It does it very fast, automatically, and does several per second. So it's a fantastic achievement from, from the engineers. But if there's more peptides in such a scan and can be sequenced, then many are not sequenced. And we, we made one that's actually when Paola Picotti, she came to our lab and we, we, we were interested in this question to what extent by just doing, speeding up this data dependent analysis, to what extent we would likely be able to eventually sequence every peptide that's in this proteome map that I showed at the beginning. And, um, so like, like what NGS is doing, where, where we can say, where we sequence in every run, if you do enough reads, everything, many times over. And so what, what, what she did, she took some highly purified proteins and, and digested them as we normally would. And she then took the best mass spectrometer we had at the time and, and simply sequenced as many peptides as she could find. And what we found was an interesting, was, was interesting and also to some extent daunting. When you just apply to a sequence of a protein the rules how trips in cleaves, you will in, normally get in the range of maybe five to twenty peptides that tryptin should generate. When it, if if everything was normal, protein is there, every site is cleaved. But she found at least an order of magnitude higher number of, of peptides from these highly purified proteins. Then we looked what these are. These are all kinds of complications. Trypsin makes a mistake. Trypsin uh, cleaves at the wrong site. The peptide has an has a 
oxidized methane, I mean, all kinds of little things. And then we, we looked what does the, what's the abundance distribution of these products, which all came from this protein. And it, it is so that usually there's like five or so which fairly highly intensity products, and then it's a very, very long tail of low intensity products, which is probably one tenths, one hundredths, one thousandths of the product, the high intensity product. So if you're an analytical chemist and you want to do one or a few proteins, it doesn't matter, it's just noise. But if you have a proteom where you have 10,000 proteins which differ in their abundance by five or six or seven orders of magnitude, the proteolytic background from the highly expressed proteins is a gigantic signal compared to the main guys from low proteins. So then that's when we concluded that by just speeding up the machine would be very daunting to, to get to a point where it can eat through the whole, this whole background. That's why we sort of using this targeting approach and the, this EIA, the data independent techniques are now simply uh, imaging the whole, the whole space um, within the depths they can do and it's about five orders of magnitude now and in there the acquisition is basically complete. So that's I think the, that's the, the shift. Yeah. It's a great advantage to measure the things you know you want to characterize in terms of the postulated or demonstrated network and pathways of the biological system instead of measuring over and over again primarily just the most abundant proteins in their peptides. So and of this, course, uh, one, should, one should still go on to discover new proteins and splice forms and so on. These, take, these targeting techniques do not give you none, do not find a new protein, but they can, for these serial measurements, they are very powerful. They don't, they only operate in a space that's known. So that they, I think they, the two branches, the discovery and this re-measurement branch, they, they both are useful and eventually they will uh, converge. Oh, yeah. Very nice talk. Thank you for all the information. Um, i just curious about with this SWATH MS technique, I, I think you were referring mainly to label free quantitation methods and I'm wondering if you could comment on on, on how reliable that is and, and, and so, so uh, you know, there's a lot of steps you go through from the, from the you know, the, the solubilization, digestion, all of those sort of things and then the mass spec, uh, you know, differential between sample, you know, ion suppression possible. Um, uh, how, 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 uh, how, how good is the quantitation across the board, uh, you know, in this, in this label free approach and, and what, what can you do as far as quality control to, you know, to, to assess, uh, you know, how reliable your quantitation is, is being. Obviously it works well because you've shown some really great correlations with the genome. I'm just curious, you know, uh, uh, when you get down to looking at individual proteins, you know, how, how, how do you know that the, the, the quantitation is working like you think it should? Thank you. So um, basically the, when you have these large data sets, these large matrices, then you can do what we actually showed in one graph. You can basically cor correlate abundances between various Samples. We also do all these repeats. Right? So, so we, when we start such a project which has several hundred or several dozen samples, we do a number of biological repeats, meaning starting with the, as you would say, from the very beginning from the biological sample, uh, let's say five times. And then we, we take from some of these samples, we do, let's say, five injections. So we basically try to establish repeats and they tell us how well was the everything, how 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 reproducible were things downstream from the mass spectrometer injection and downstream from the isolation. This this gives us then uh, a guide, a guideline or a benchmark to say if signals emerge that um, are not just spurious but basically consistent from other samples, when you have biologically different samples, that these have biological meaning. So that's, that's what we, we do, we basically work with. Repeats we do not usually do, uh, although sometimes we do duplicates of every sample, but some, sometimes we just do this assessment of the variability in one data set and then assume that the other sample in that sample set behaves the same way. Now uh, for about, is it better to, in, to add isotope label peptides or some form of labeling versus non-labeling? Non I used to be very strongly in the labeling camp. Now I'm strongly in the in the 
label free cam if one compares very similar samples because it's, it's also fewer uh, fewer steps. But some of these data, the uh, like the SILAC data, were actually labeling data on this work also, it just clutters up the spectrum. Yeah, I would say that in it of course depends on the effort that you do and how much reactionation you do. But I would I would think that it's been actually looked at by people who like Eric when you when you um, when you when you look at the uh, transcripts and also the protein levels of and do some estimate of of, of abundance that it's really not a problem to get down to low numbers of of proteins if you do lots of separation. Now, we don't want to do a lot of separation, usually if you want to do many samples, because it, it just becomes untractable. But if, but I would assume that in the data, these 14 and a half thousand proteins, there will be a majority of very low level expressed proteins, as long as they are soluble. I mean, there's, if it's some, something is in chromatin and it's precipitated out, of course, you won't, you won't I think accessibility and solubility are the much bigger determinants of the blind spot than the sheer abundance. For the SWOS technique? Yes. So we inject, we inject uh, one to two microgram of total peptide mass, and we know that, for instance, from a milligram of tissue, wet tissue, for instance, from a needle biopsy, uh, after protein extraction, that's typically about 50 microgram of of peptide generated. So that, and so that, I mean, we can of course not generate one microgram, inject the whole thing, you have injected issues and so, but, but I think if you have 10 microgram of peptide, which would relate, which would relate to some uh, 100 micrograms of tissue, then uh, that, that's not. We, so, cannot, we actually cannot inject more, because that's what the cost. Yeah, that's another problem. Yeah, yeah, it's another problem. Of course, you, you can also inject much less, but then you simply don't have enough. Uh, I mean, you sacrifice dynamic range. So, in the prototypes, are you proceeding to look at interesting post translational modifications, uh, splice isoforms that probably modify all these pathways or execute some of the features of these pathways? Yes, so we're very interested in, modifi in modifications. And uh, this is the. the in, in this in this targeting techniques, you have an advantage that you also get um, uh, retention time information. Basically, when they come off the cone, because you you measure repeatedly the same peptide, you can reconstruct the chromatographic illusion. And one of the with, with modifications, one of the big problems, specifically, is come up with protein phosphorylation is the question at what hydroxyl residue in that peptide is actually the peptide attached. So to, the, to say a peptide is, is a phosphopeptide is well resolved, and we can say that, but where exactly the phosphate is attached is a difficult issue. So a number of people, including also Alexi, have written software tools that attempt to do, resolve that. Um, if you have, let's say, three hydroxyls, three serines, which one and you know that from the mass, it is one exactly one phosphate, but which, which one it actually is is a difficult issue. So these tools work, of course, as well as they can work if the spectra tell us. But if you have two neighboring serines, and it could be the one or the other, and they're simply, they may simply in the spectrum, even our very close examination, may simply be no fragment that distinguishes the two. So what we found, and others, of course, too, is that even though they, even though they may look very similar from the spectrum, when you run them across the column, the column, the reverse column, has remarkable ability 
to separate them out. So they even even the one one position over of attachment of the phosphate will very often I'm not saying every time but very often lead to a, um, a chromatographic separation. So this this of course when you reconstruct these chromatographic peaks that information then is present and you can at least say there's two or three forms of the peptide that chromatographically separate but have the same mass the same seek backbone sequence and exactly one phosphate so you can say you have let's say two or three forms you may not be able to say exactly which one it is but you may say there's more than one and to resolve them you can simply make a, a synthetic analog and then it's, then it's clear so i think this is a it's kind of a, a, a hidden advantage to this targeting method because you, you can factor in the chromatographic uh, time better you can of course also do that in in shotgun mode, but there you don't have not, not, not a lot of, lot of control. There in the peak, the pep that is selected from uh, for fragmentation. So it's, it's harder to do there. So I'm so glad you mentioned Alexei many times. He sends all of you his regards from England. Unfortunately, the schedule that worked for Rudy did not work for Alexei, but he's very much in our thoughts here. And of course, to one of Rudy's many star proteges, we're very proud to have him here. Rudy, thank you so much for such yeah, a comprehensive you. lecture.